You know, um, I, I don't know about you, but um, being an adult is hard. Can I? Amen. Okay. I just wish I could go back to Mila, Mila's age and get maybe not the diaper changes, but, you know, like the getting every, you know, getting my meals and getting my, you know, everything. I just have to make a little noise and someone's over me saying, like, what can I do for you? What can I help you with? Amen. Being an adult is hard. But I'm thankful that we have a, an oasis here on Sundays. Um, and, on, and on, you know, anytime we get on Zoom or anytime that we come together and we fellowship together, this is an oasis for me. I don't know about you, but I can kind of get away from being an adult for a second. I can just be um, what God meant for me to be, and that's just to worship and be in his presence. Amen? Amen. That's, that's not my sermon. I just, this week has been a, a long week, and so I'm just thankful to be here with you. You know, we live in a world that has put a a premium on quantity, how many or how much of something that you, that someone has in their possession. The more you have of something, the more favorable people perceive you, and that, that's certain things, obviously, you know, if you have more than, um, uh, if you have more than one head, people might think that that's a little weird, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, uh, if you have one of most things, that's deemed as normal or mediocre. So you don't hear of laws being passed um, by just one, by a single vote. Um, you don't, uh, the whole drama around every election is how many votes that one particular person got. And that's in the millions and thousands. And you don't, just a single signature from me or you to our local city wouldn't, necessarily do much, but if you have a thousand signatures and a petition um, from the people in your community, people start listening. People in Texas don't go around bragging about the one cow that they have on their ranch, right? They talk about the many heads of cattle that they, they might brag about their one belt buckle that they have, but they don't brag about the number of, if they have the one cow, they have multiple cows. In some circles, and I assure you this is not mine, but one house is mediocre. One, uh, they, so they talk about the number of homes they have across the world, the number of cars that they have in their garages, the number of wives they, never mind, will not go there. One wife is enough. Amen. Can I, all, the, all the men in the, amen, married men, can we get an amen? One wife is enough. I'm going to move on. I've, spent a, I've been around people that think the number of degrees or the number of years spent studying a certain thing uh, at a university, that dictated success. They, they're in the room and they say, I have an, a BA, an MBA, an MFA, a JD, an ABC, an LMNOP, a QRSING. Oh, come on, somebody. That was funny. So many degrees, they might as well be a thermometer. But that number of degrees that they have is dictating their success. Their, it, the number of the things that they have it will help them get a job. It will help increase their salary. It will give them more authority, more prestige. It's quantity. They, they don't just want one of something. They want many of something. And our way of life has shifted that the more you have, the more you matter. It's really kind of sad because it's shifted into even our normal life. The Internet has made this worse because now it's not just about the number of things that people have, but what the number of people say about a certain thing that dictates how I make my decisions. People will buy clothes, shoes, jewelry, cologne, you name it, and there is a social media influencer that is trying to get the likes and trying to get the clout because they're trying to say to, to sell a, an, uh, a particular thing. I work in advertising, and we look at uh, you know a particular influencer, and we say, we're going to try to... Um, sponsor that a product through that person because we know that there will be people that like that per- the particular influencer. And so if we can just get the number of likes, then that uh, will be success. There are people that they haven't even tried the shoes that they're about to buy, but yet they see that there are 100,000 reviews, four-star reviews on Amazon, and so these shoes must be great. I don't think, do you buy shoes on Amazon? Okay, good. On DSW or wherever. I don't buy shoes, so obviously. Rebecca will double check Yelp five times before we go to a single restaurant because she has to see if other people have given these places a review before we go there. 
We don't know these people, but yet we determine our decisions based on the number of people that have been there and have liked it. The internet is training us to live in this herd mentality that in order to be accepted, we need to do what the masses are doing. But, and this is deep, so follow me, okay? If everyone else is doing, is every, if everyone else is looking to see what everyone else is looking for, to see what they're, everyone else is going to look for, you still following me? Okay. Don't hurt yourself. Do they actually know what they're doing? If everyone else is looking for everyone for everyone else who's looking for everyone else, then what are we looking for? Don't hurt yourself. I know that kind of was, was a little deep for a Sunday morning. Basically, when the blind lead the blind, they'll likely end up in a ditch. Amen? This mentality has seeped into Christianity. Many people today are attending churches that they chose not based on prayerful consideration, but because it was most highly rated on Google. And that is scary. Not because they are seeking out truth or biblical teaching, but because the pastor is hip, fashionable, and has a mass following on social media or says the right thing on IGTV. Luckily, we have a pastor that is the butter man, and he does both. <laughs> Amen. While I'm not here to meddle today in the way that you shop or the restaurants you choose when you leave here today, because that mentality is just going to be the way that we shop and the way that we, uh, we go to restaurants. Um, I'm not trying to change Rebecca this morning because I know I can't. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of shopping and, and looking at reviews. I, though, believe that the Lord has sent me this morning to Westchester Church with a, with a word that if we're going to call ourselves Christians and live by that definition, which is a person that exemplifies the teachings of Christ, then we cannot. Let that mentality get into our minds and in our spirit. Amen? Because one is enough. Amen? One is enough. In Genesis, in six days, six days we, we read in Genesis chapter 1 of God speaking things into existence. In multiples, though. He said, let there be light. And then he started creating planets. He started creating stars. He started creating animals. He started the, the fish in the sea, the, the birds in the sky. And he, he created all these things. These things just started existing. They, uh, at his word, they started existing. He created these things in multiples. With words, he created planets, stars, animals, oceans. They all came into existence. Great care was taken. I promise you, great care was taken to make sure everything was perfect and it was part of his perfect plan. But when it came to us, when it came to humanity, when it came to the actual reason why he created everything else, he didn't speak it into existence. He came down and he, the Bible says he formed man out of the dust and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. He started with one. He formed just one. He didn't just create a, a million humans and just said, all right, you guys, go have fun. That's what he did with the planets. That's what he did with the stars. That's what he did with, with everything else. But with man, with the person that his, with the, the thing that he wanted a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, a free will relationship with, he started with just one. Amen? You following me? And because we, he knew that Adam wouldn't be able to keep the garden in order by himself, he created Eve. Because we need women in our life. I need, I need my wife in my life. He created a, a, the first couple, the first man and woman, this free will relationship with them. That was enough for him. He just wanted Someone to, some, somebody to worship him because they wanted to. That's, he created all of this just for one, one relationship. That's all that he wanted. Creation revealed his nature from the very beginning that one has always been enough for him. One, not three, not hundreds, not thousands, just one. And he cared so much about the one that he created that even when they messed up, even when they failed, even when they lied, even when they tried to hide from his presence, 
even when they did the opposite of the thing that they were supposed to do, he didn't wipe them off the face of the earth he created. He still loved the one. He still clothed the one. He still provided for the one. He still loved the one that he created because he created them different than the others. He didn't need to recreate them. The one that he made was enough for him. And this pattern continues throughout the Old Testament. Even when his his creation rejected him, he chose one family, one man, Noah, to build an ark. That was all it took. It took one man, one family, one ark to save humanity. One family was enough. He had a plan that to save a nation of people that he would lead, guide, and protect. He started with a covenant with one, Abraham, Genesis 17. God tells him that his seed would number the stars in the sky, the sands on the seashore. Human uh, mentality, we would, if we would question that plan. We would say, but God, if, if you wanted to do all of that, if you wanted, to, if you wanted my seed, if you wanted, if you wanted me to, to have all of these different kids, I think you're going to have to start with someone a little younger. Uh, it seems a little far-fetched, God. You're, you know, I'm 90 years old. I'm not able to have a bunch of kids right now. I, I, I don't know what you're wanting me to do. I don't know how I can be the father of your nation. And, and really, God is just saying, yeah, but I'm just going to start with you, Abraham. And all I need you to do is just have one. Because I can work with one. I can, my perfect plan can, can work with just one. One. Don't don't get caught up in the thousands. Don't get caught up in the. I I know I I gave you the end picture because I can. Me, God, I can handle the the number. I can handle the quantity. But really, I'm just going to focus on you. I'm going to focus on the one. And you may be sitting here in this room today, and God has promised you some things, and He's promised you that He's going to bring salvation to your lost family and to your neighborhood or your school. And don't get all analytical. On this thing, because God may have shown you the end picture of your family being saved or that your community being saved, but don't don't get caught up in the end picture because all you have to realize is that God has called you. He's called one, and one for God is enough. Can I get an amen on that? You are enough. One is enough. It's your faith. Your faith is enough. It's the faith of one grain of mustard seed. That's it. That's all it takes. You don't need anything else. If he promised it to you and you have a little bit of faith, you are enough. That promise is enough. God has promised Westchester Church revival at 690 North Broadway. He's promised us revival at West 37th Street. He's promised revival for every daughter work that we ever we ever uh, can start. And that may be Tomorrow, that may be five years from now, that may be 50 years from now, but he has promised that. We, as a church, can't get caught up in all of the, the analytical things that we try to do of saying, yeah, but yeah, but like that means that we're going to need 50 more people, or that means we're going to need 100 more people, or we're going to need 50,000 more dollars, or we're going to need 150,000 more do- dollars. In or- no, 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 no. He has promised one church revival, and he has just one church. <laughs> He says, Peter, that you are, thou art Peter, and I will build my church upon you, Peter, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is working with one church, and one is enough. We don't have to worry about X, Y, and Z. We just have to worry that every time someone comes into this place, someone that comes out from our community, someone that comes to us from our schools, someone that comes to us from our job, we just have to worry about the one. And God will take care of the rest of the promise. Revival in this city is not just about me, though. It's about him living inside of me. He showed time and time again that he was enough for his people. He never left his creation. Despite their rebellious, sinful nature, he demonstrated time and time and time and time again that he would provide for them, that he would protect them, that he would govern them, and that he would lead them. This is why he gave such an authoritative tone in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 when he's trying to tell the people who who their God is. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I am everything you need. You don't need Baal. You don't need... uh, Krishna, you don't need uh, any of these other gods that you're 
you're making with your hands. I am God, and I am God alone. And their response was a response of just a regular human person, human being. They're like, but God, one is not enough. Taking earthly materials, they start creating dead idols to worship instead. Because the theme throughout humanity is that flesh will never feel like he is enough. That the one true God who created and watches over us is enough. We, we buck that. We, we, we feel like that that's not enough. That surely God uh, alone can't handle all of my problems. Surely God alone can't, can't handle um, all that. That's why they, they put these gods into buckets. This is the God of, of, uh, of the sun. This is the God of, the, of space. This is the God of earth. This is the God of, of, uh, of, um, of fertility. This is, and they start making all of these different gods because they're saying, like, surely one god is not enough. I've got to, I've got to separate all these gods into these different buckets because I, more, I need more than just one. But God is saying, yeah, but I'm the one that's feeding you. I'm the one that's giving you manna. I'm the one that's putting a pillar of fire, a pillar of uh, fire by uh, night and a cloud by morning. I'm protecting you. I'm the one that, that uh, parted the Red Sea. I'm, I'm doing all of these different things. I am enough for you, people of Israel. I am enough. Over and over and over through Israel's spotted history, instead of a perfect and upright eternal king, they wanted to be like all the other nations, and they wanted to bring their own king in. You remember the story the, of, they said, Samuel, give us a king just like the other nations. And hear the question from God through Samuel. He, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of king that shall reign over them. And so that's what Samuel did. He told them, are you sure? Are you sure that you want to go down this road? Because instead of an eternal king, instead of just one king, what you are asking for is that from now until the end of time, is that you are bringing in a a human. You are bringing in generations of human kings that have failures that will that will fall and not only that but they're going to take your children to be in their wars they're going to take your your sons to be in their wars they're going to take your daughters to to work in and in, in, in their kingdom they're going to take your crops they're going to take your food they're going to take your riches they're going to they're going to I'm not requiring that of you are you sure that's what you want and their answer was yes because one is not enough you are not enough and God forbid that in the world that we live in, in the, in the weeks that we, that we go throughout our lives, that we look at God and we say, God, I know that you're able to protect me. I know that you're able to provide for me. I know that, you're, that you've done all of this, but really, I, I, I have my doubts. I have my, I have my concerns with that. So let me, let me just lean more into BBDO. Let me just lean more into my place of work. Let me just lean more into my, my health insurance. Let me lean, and I'm going I'm to surround myself with these options because I don't believe that you're enough. I'm not saying jobs and health insurance aren't important. I'm saying that we can put such a premium and such a value on those things that we forget that there is a God. There is a one God that leads us and like and is leading us to have a relationship with him. And if we're not careful, we can let the things of this world distract us from the one thing that truly matters. They got exactly what they asked for. Corruption, war, death, famine. Even the more righteous kings like David and Solomon made mistakes and brought judgment onto Israel. It seems like a pretty bad return on investment, if you, if you ask me. But God still continued to prove that he was everything that, he, that they needed. And he did it for us. He did it for those that would come after uh, these rebellious, stiff-necked people. He continued to have a testimony that he would always be faithful no matter the mistakes, no matter the rebellion, no matter the things that would get in the way. He always is enough, and he wanted to show throughout Scripture so that we could look through Scripture and we say it doesn't matter what we do. If we just call upon the name of Jesus, he'll be enough for us. Ask Elisha the power of one. He stood before all the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. It was the one true God who responded by fire. 
sheer number of idols or prophets mattered in the moment for uh, Israel when they, they were saying, look at all the gods that we have. Look at all the prophets we have. Elisha, you, you're, you're dumb if you think that you can outnumber us. But Elisha says, it's not about me. It's about the one that I serve. And the one was the one that responded by fire. Ask Nebuchadnezzar the, what the power of one was. He threw three men into that fiery furnace. And he had probably thrown many men in the fiery furnace before, but there was never the one that appeared to help. And the one was the one that made the difference for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was the one that all of a sudden came in, and when they pulled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, they, they said, why aren't you scorched? Why, why don't you have anything wrong with you? And he said, it's because of the one that was in the fire with us. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6 says, I am the Lord. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. They that may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. He is the one. He continues to show us in the New Testament. John John the Baptist's whole sermon was to tell us about the one that was coming. There is one coming after me, he preached, whose sandals I am not worthy to latch. And he finds himself in prison, and he he wants to make sure that he really found the one. Before he dies, he wants to make sure that the one that he he said, you know, I I think that's the one. I just want to make sure. And so he sent his disciples out, Matthew 11, 2 through 6. Now, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. He said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Are you the one? Jesus said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to, to them. And, he, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. What is he saying to those disciples? He's saying, first of all, you go and tell John, I am the one. I'm the one because I'm the one that has been prophesied that I would it, uh, heal the sick. I would give sight to the blind. I would preach deliverance to the captives. I'm the one, John. But the other thing he's saying is that whosoever shall not be offended in that fact, blessed is he. In other words, the one that understands and finds the one and stays with him will lead a blessed life. We see the ultimate culmination of this through God's mission in his death, burial, and resurrection. He proves once and for all that he alone is enough to redeem us, to sanctify us, to take care of the sin problem that Adam and Eve gave us. One's man mistake was enough to separate him, us from a relationship with God. Romans, 12, uh, Romans 5 and 12, wherefore as by one man, everyone say one, one man sinned in, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Romans 5 uh, and 13, it goes on. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that hath not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense. So also is the free gift, for if, that if through the offense of one, many be dead, many much much more the grace of God and the gift by, by the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by, okay, you guys are learning. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by One, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so the righteousness of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall be made, many be made righteous. And this is the greatest oneness message that you'll ever hear. Because 
One man was enough to separate us from God. One uh, human's mistake in a garden was enough to keep us from an eternity with him. One man's mistake was enough. But I'm so thankful that it didn't stop there because there was another man. And he, because he was a spotless, unblemished lamb, ready for sacrifice, could come into this world, walk a sinless life. He would sacrifice that life for us. And because of that, many shall be made righteous. One was enough. And I'm thankful for that one. I'm thankful for that one. And this is why, this is why the devil tries so hard to deceive the world into thinking that there's more than one up there. Right? And this is why he is okay with thousands upon thousands of people on this world believing that there's more than one up there. There are people that feel and believe that there is Father, then there's a Son, and then there's Holy Spirit, and that those are three separate entities. But I'm here to tell you that if there were three up there, the power of the one coming and dying for us is diminished. You know, I can't imagine... After having, after having Mila, I can't imagine what kind of father I would want to serve. That in order for, in order for something amazing to happen, in order for, for the, the lives of my creation to be saved, a life had to be given. I can't imagine what kind of father would look and would shift that responsibility onto their child. To say, I could, I could give my life, but I really don't want to. So, Jesus, the Son, you go do it. You go through the pain. You go through the torment. You go, you go, th- and you deal with the cross. You deal with, with the people that will hate you, the people that will spit at you, the people that will ridicule you. I don't want to deal with that. I'm, I'm good up here all behind my throne, so you go and do it. What kind of father, what kind of family member, would do that. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that God said, I'm going to wrap myself in flesh. I'm going to walk the, the earth. I'm going to be all of man while still being all of God. I'm just going to be the one way of salvation for my people. I'm not going to pass this on to anybody else. I am enough. My, my plan is enough. Hallelujah. And the devil is certainly content with us just thinking that there are three up there because it diminishes the power of the one. He doesn't share power with anyone else. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't sit up there and have to ask a committee of what, of what happens. He, he is one up there, and he is enough for every problem, every circumstance that we deal with. And I'm thankful that I don't have to, I don't have to be worried about which one I go, through, go to when I have a problem. I don't, have to, I don't have to worry myself about, am I going to the right person? Am I praying enough to the right one? Who do, how, do I, how do I live my life, and, 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 and who do I talk to? I, I can just talk to to the one, and the one is enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that one died for me. That one took on stripes for my healing. That one is the one that watches out for me. He is enough for me this morning, and he is enough for you. Not as He's enough for this church, but I want you to know that you are enough for him. Yes, he deals with the multitudes. Yes, he deals with the number of people, and he's perfectly able to do that. But when it all comes down, at the end of the day, he just wants to commune with you. He just wants to fellowship with you. He just wants to spend time with you because you are enough for him. How do I know that? It's because it's evident throughout his entire ministry because he, he, he went out of his way just to talk to the woman at the well. He went out of his way just to talk to the one. He went out of his way to save just the one. In Luke chapter 15, he taught of a parable that just is a complete, 
uh, revealing of his nature. He says, what man, uh, Luke 15, 3, what man have you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and the nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. He is happy. He needs the 99. But when the one is lost, he will go out of his way just to find the one. Because the one that is lost is enough for him to step down from his throne and go searching and seeking and convicting to do what he can to make sure that that one sheep is brought back into the fold. Because the one is enough. He continues and he says, and I say unto likewise, the joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, when if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth on her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repentance. It's a picture of a God that is willing to get down on his hands and his knees and search the house and search the world over for the one sinner that may come to him. He searches and he seeks after the one that was lost because the one matters to him. The lost matters to him. And don't be fooled, this thing has always been about one. And the devil is content for us to get so caught up in caring about the number of people in attendance in our church and the number of programs that we have and the number of things, but we have to take on the mentality of Christ that we have to worry about the one. This parable isn't just talking about his nature, it should be talking about our nature. That the one that is lost should be so, so important to us. It should be so meaningful to us that it doesn't matter if we have 50 to 100 people in this place. It doesn't matter if we have 5,000. I'm going to do what I can to reach the one that is lost. To reach the neighbor that I have that is lost. To reach the schoolmate that I have that is lost. The one matters to him and the one should matter to us. should matter to us. But yet, I'm going to be talking to Westchester Church here this morning. We get caught up in this whole numbers, quantity thing. We misquote Deuteronomy 32 and 30. And hear me, I'm I'm not denigrating these scriptures at all. But... Deuteronomy 32 and 30 will quote, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold, sold them and the Lord had shut them up? We take this out of context, Pastor, sometimes because we look for the number of people that are in the room and we say, well, if, if one person can do this and two people, well, imagine, what, imagine what 50 people could do. Look, how many people would, that, would we be able to affect if we, had, if we had all these people? What about Leviticus 26, 7 through 8? And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall, be, fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. This sounds amazing because we care about the quantity sometimes. We get so caught up in the quantity. Look what five people can do with the help of the Lord. What, look what a hundred people. I, 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 I can't do it just by myself. I need, I need other people around me. We say... Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will, we, we take these scriptures and we put it through the filter of, I, I can't do it by myself. I need to have other people around me. But I'm telling you, one is enough. You are enough to bring revival. You are enough. Yes, I'm, I'm, not, talk, I'm not denigrating these, these scriptures. There, there is power in numbers. There's power in this church. There's power when we can connect together. But you are enough. Your Bible study will be enough. Your, your, your smile and your prayer for somebody, it's enough. You don't have to have five people around you. You don't have to have a whole church of 50 to do something. You are enough. You are enough. Because God wants someone just to stand up and say, I, I want to do, I want to have the mentality of Christ that, 
I will search the world over. I will look at my community. I will look at the, the people around me. And I, I, yes, I have, we have the 45 people in this room that are in the fold, and I'm thankful for you. But when the one is out, I got to go looking for them. When the one is lost, I got to do what I can to get out of the, the, the safety of my pen, and I got to go and find the one that is lost. Hallelujah. If you'd stand with me this morning. Pastor, you said this last week, so this is not my thought. But it's just been sitting with me since you said it. I, I think it was two or three weeks ago. God visits with Abraham. He has a conversation with him about Lot. He says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy it. Absolutely demolish it. Abraham, he says, but God, I, Lot's there. Are you gonna you gonna destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Lots there. What what if there are what if there are righteous in the city? And Pastor, you said it. He went he went down the negotiations with God. But if if what I'm seeing of the nature of God is, he could have got him all the way down to just one. And I believe, Pastor, I agree with you. I believe that one would have been enough to save Sodom and Gomorrah. And the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is are we content? Are we content with getting God down all the way to the number that we're comfortable with because it seems like a pretty good number? When we could just, in a little bit more prayer and a little bit more fasting, a little bit more effort from us, we could realize the power that we have to reach the one. The sway that we have with God to say, God, I just, I just, want, my, I just want my lost husband saved. I just want my lost children saved. I just want my neighbor saved. I, I don't. I know you're able to do more than that. I know that you're able to, to reach my entire city. I know that you're able to reach my entire community, God. But my children, my child, my wife, my husband, my friend, my, my brother, my sister, the, the one, God, just, just give me the one right now. That's, I, just want, I just want the one. And I know that the nature of God is saying, yes. One is enough for me to move. One is enough for me to release my spirit. One is enough if they'll just come to me, if they'll just repent, if they'll just fall on their face. If you'll just tell them about me, I'll convict them. If, if you'll just do something, I will work in the one because one is enough for him. And he stands at the door of the one door and he knocks. And he knocks and he knocks and he knocks and he's waiting just, he's waiting for someone to open the door and let him in. It's not, it's not the group, it's not the multitude, it's the one because he just wants to, he just wants the one. He wants the relationship with the one. And as a church, we have to understand and realize that yes, there are, there are 50 plus people and, and yes, we all, we work together as a church and yes, the church is enough to win our city but at the end of the day, we are just individuals living for God. We are individuals that have a relationship with God and we have an obligation this morning to make sure that when we leave this place that the same passion, the same desire for the one that God has must be in our heart. It's got to be in our heart. One is enough. One is enough. Hallelujah. I'm going to open up the altars this morning, and I know this is this is a little bit of a different of a sermon. Whether or not you are the one that God has died for, and yet you have not re repented or you have not received the Holy Ghost, I'm here to tell you that there is enough for you in this room today for you to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is enough, there is enough forgiveness. 
for you to, to, have, to repent and to receive the Holy Ghost here this morning. There is enough for you, and God cares about you this morning. But for the rest of us, I'm asking you that you would find a place in prayer today and you ask the Lord to give you the desire and the passion for the one that may have just gotten lost over, the, over time. Because yes, he died for you. Yes, he, he did all that for you. But we can't afford to forget the fact that he died for you, the one. And he also died for your neighbor also. He died for your family members also. And he needs us to share that with them. A reminder of a reinvigorated passion and desire for a, a lost soul. Not lost souls, plural, but a lost soul. One is enough. One is enough for action. Why don't we find a place in prayer this, this morning? I believe that the presence of God is in this place. The Holy Ghost is moving. He wants to change us this morning. He wants to change our mindset this morning. Let him speak to you. Let him change you. One is enough.